Welcome to section one of general pathology. In this section, we'll be discussing growth adaptations. Let's get started. Growth adaptations refer to reversible cellular changes in an attempt to adapt to stress that is placed on cells. The different types of growth adaptations are changes in size, number, phenotype, metabolic activity, and functions of cells. If a cell is unable to adapt, especially in situations where there is chronic stress, injury occurs. All right, with this in mind, Here's our overview slide, and let's begin by discussing hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Hypertrophy and hyperplasia refer to an increase in organ size secondary to increase in stress. Now, generally speaking, an organ can increase in size in three ways. One, by increasing the size of cells, and this is called hypertrophy. Two, by increasing the number of cells, and this is called hyperplasia. Or three, the cell can undergo both hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Generally, hypertrophy and hyperplasia occur together. For example, in iodine deficiency, thyroid enlargement occurs in order to increase thyroid hormone synthesis. The thyroid enlargement occurs via hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now, one extremely high yield point to keep in mind is that permanent tissues only undergo hypertrophy and not hyperplasia. This is because permanent cells cannot divide as they lack stem cells. Remember, permanent cells include neurons, skeletal muscle myocytes, and cardiomyocytes. Therefore, since permanent tissues are innately unable to undergo hyperplasia, any growth is automatically hypertrophy. As far as mechanisms are involved, hypertrophy involves increased production of cellular proteins, which occurs via gene activation. This leads to protein formation via transcription and translation, which then leads to increased production of organelles and other cellular components, which ultimately increases the size of the cell. Hyperplasia, on the other hand, is a result of growth factor stimulation of stem cells. So the stem cells mature, and this yields an increase in the number of cells. All right, let's practice with a question. A 43-year-old male with a history of long-standing hypertension presents with shortness of breath, lightheadedness, and palpitations. Physical exam is significant for an S4 heart sound, but otherwise unremarkable. Labs are all within normal limits. After thorough evaluation, it is concluded that the patient's symptoms are due to pathologic changes involving thickening of the left ventricle. What type of growth adaptation is occurring in this patient's diseased organ? All right, based on the question, Sam, you may have been able to appreciate that the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy. If not, don't worry, since we'll be covering the topic in great detail in our cardiology section. For our purposes here, though, we're interested in the thickening of the left ventricle and the cellular mechanism by which it's happening. Really, it's a simple question. We want to know if cells in the left ventricle are simply getting larger or if there are actually more cells. In order to get this question right, you had to have recalled that the three permanent tissues are neurons, skeletal muscle myocytes, and cardiac myocytes. So with this in mind and thinking about the left ventricle of the heart, we can confidently say that cardiac myocytes are a permanent cell type. So in this case, the cells are getting larger or undergoing hypertrophy rather than hyperplasia. Remember, hyperplasia does not happen in permanent tissues like the heart. So the type of growth adaptation occurring here is hypertrophy. Here we have a gross image of left ventricular hypertrophy. As you can see, the cross section of the left ventricle looks way thicker than the right ventricle. As already discussed, this occurs in response to hypertension-induced increase in cardiac workload, which eventually results in ventricular muscle hypertrophy. Now, hypertrophy and hyperplasia can occur either in pathologic states or in physiologic conditions. Physiologic hypertrophy occurs to increase the functional capacity of organs to meet the needs of the body. One example of physiologic hypertrophy and hyperplasia is depicted by proliferation of the glandular epithelium of the female breast during pregnancy. In this case, the breasts grow in size in order to increase their functional capacity, which in turn helps them to prepare for breastfeeding when the baby is born. Pathologic hypertrophy is caused by excessive or inappropriate actions of hormones or growth factors acting on target cells. Pathologic hyperplasia can progress to dysplasia and ultimately cancer. For example, hyperplasia of endometrial tissue can occur with increased estrogen stimulation. This endometrial hyperplasia can then progress to dysplasia and further progression may lead to endometrial cancer. All right, now let's move on to discuss atrophy. Simply put, atrophy refers to a decrease in organ size 
due to decrease in stress. Atrophy can occur due to a decrease in the number or size of cells. But since they occur so concurrently, we only have one word for organ shrinking, as opposed to the two we had for growth. Decreases in cell number occurs via apoptosis. Decrease in cell size is a little bit more involved because there are two mechanisms whereby this occurs. The first one is the ubiquitin proteasomal degradation pathway, and the second is autophagy. Here's an illustration depicting the ubiquitin proteasomal degradation pathway. At first, the protein substrates to be degraded are tagged with ubiquitin chains in the presence of ATP, which we can see right here. Then, the ubiquitin tagged proteins are recognized by the proteasome, and a proteasome is an organelle that digests proteins. So the proteasome breaks down the protein into amino acids, and due to the destruction of proteins, the cell size decreases. All right, now let's talk about autophagy which is depicted with this image. This involves the following steps. One, formation of the autophagosome. Two, engulfing of contents. And three, fusion of the autophagosome with the lysosome. And this leads to hydrolysis of contents by the lysosome's digestive enzymes. So as you can see, autophagy refers to the cell destroying its own components, hence the name autophagy. And with degradation of intracellular components, the cell size shrinks. Again, as we saw in the case of hypertrophy and hyperplasia, atrophy can also be physiologic or pathologic. Physiologic atrophy is seen in normal embryonic development. When the embryo is developing, there are various structures which are not required in adults, so these structures undergo atrophy. Examples of such structures include the notochord, thyroglossal duct, and interdigital webs. Pathologic atrophy can occur in the following conditions. Decreased hormonal stimulation or decreased nutrient blood supply, and an example of this is hypopituitarism, which causes atrophy of organs like the thyroid gland due to decreased stimulation of TSH. Another pathologic cause of atrophy is disuse atrophy. An example of this is skeletal muscle atrophy when a fractured bone is immobilized in a plaster cast for a long time. Loss of innervation or denervation atrophy is another cause. An example of this is atrophy of skeletal muscle tissue following loss of lower motor neurons in amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS. Finally, pressure atrophy can also cause it. And an example of this is atrophy of surrounding tissues due to an enlarging benign tumor. All right, now let's talk about metaplasia. Metaplasia is a stress-induced reversible change in which one cell type, classically epithelial or mesenchymal, is replaced by another cell type. Metaplasia involves reprogramming of stem cells to produce new cells that can handle stress in a better way. Removal of a stressor may reverse metaplasia. Metaplasia most commonly involves change of one type of epithelium to another. For example, chronic irritation by cigarette smoke can cause the normal ciliated columnar epithelial cells of the trachea and bronchi to be replaced by stratified squamous epithelial cells. Another classic and high yield example is Barrett's esophagus, which is seen in chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD. Other high yield examples include vitamin A deficiency and myositis ossificans. With persistent stress, however, metaplasia may progress to dysplasia and eventually cancer. So for example, in chronic GERD, there is acid that's going from the stomach up into the esophagus. And over time, the esophageal tissue changes, so it undergoes metaplasia, and this is known as Barrett's esophagus. If this goes unchecked, it can eventually progress to dysplasia. And finally, esophageal adenocarcinoma. One high yield exception to this metaplasia to cancer concept to keep in mind is apocrine metaplasia of the breast. This refers to fibrocystic changes of the breast and has no significant increased risk of progression to cancer. Let's talk about Barrett's esophagus in a bit more detail. In a normal esophagus, the lumen is lined by non-keratinizing squamous epithelial cells. In the setting of chronic reflux, acid from the stomach inappropriately passes up through the gastroesophageal junction and damages the esophageal epithelium. Eventually, this leads to metaplasia, such that the native cells of the esophagus undergo metaplastic change to columnar epithelium with goblet cells, which is also known as mucinous columnar epithelium. Remember, mucinous columnar epithelium is the native lining of the stomach, so it makes sense that the esophageal cells adapt and become similar to gastric cells in the presence of an acidic environment. As mentioned earlier, Barrett's esophagus is a precancerous lesion with an increased risk of progression to esophageal adenocarcinoma. Here's a histological image of the characteristic changes in a patient with Barrett's esophagus. If we look closely, we can see some elongated columnar cells right here. And we can also see that there are dispersed goblet cells in between, for example, right here. This is the histological finding of mucinous columnar epithelial cells within the esophagus. And again, this is diagnostic for Barrett's esophagus.
All right, now let's discuss vitamin A deficiency. Vitamin A deficiency can also cause metaplasia, and this is because vitamin A is needed for the differentiation of specialized epithelial surfaces. In vitamin A deficiency, the thin squamous lining of the conjunctiva undergoes metaplasia into stratified keratinizing squamous epithelium, and this transformation is known as keratomalacia. Grossly, an eye with keratomalacia appears cloudy with a softened cornea. Here's an image of this. Note the cornea right here that appears softer and more gelatinous in consistency. The last example of metaplasia we'll discuss is myositis ossificans. This is a metaplasia of connective tissue. So in this type of metaplasia, muscular tissue undergoes metaplasia to become bone. And this usually occurs after injury as part of an erroneous healing process. Here's an image of a patient who has undergone surgery, as we can see by the screw seen on this plain film right here. And we can see the cloudy hyperdense region right here, which is suggestive of bony changes of the healing muscle surrounding the screw. So essentially the muscle has turned into bone. All right, let's finish up by discussing dysplasia. In simple terms, dysplasia refers to disordered cell growth. Unlike the other growth adaptations I talked about in this presentation, dysplasia is not a true adaptive response. Dysplasia is usually preceded by long-standing pathologic hyperplasia or metaplasia. One thing to keep in mind is that dysplasia is non-neoplastic, but it can be precancerous. For example, CIN, or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, is a dysplastic precursor to cervical cancer and is characterized as a precancerous lesion. Mild and moderate dysplasias, which do not involve the entire thickness of the epithelium, may regress with alleviation of the inciting stress. So dysplasia is a reversible change. However, severe dysplasia becomes irreversible and may progress to carcinoma if the stress is not removed. Dysplastic cells are characterized by loss of tissue architecture and nuclear changes. Nuclear changes include an increase in the nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, or N to C ratio. This occurs as the nucleus increases in size at a rate greater than the cytoplasm, and we also see chromatin clumping within the larger nucleus. All right, now that we've covered the information, let's review with the question. A 56-year-old male with a chronic cough, numerous respiratory infections, and a 40-pack year smoking history presents with streaky blood in his sputum. Chest x-ray reveals hyperinflated lungs but no infiltrates or masses. Bronchoscopy is performed and samples of bronchial mucosa are biopsied. Microscopy reveals areas of stratified squamous epithelium. The pathogenesis of this patient's microscopic findings is most similar to which of the following conditions? A. Barrett esophagus B. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy C. Streak ovary or D. Cervical cancer Alright, we have a 56-year-old male with a chronic history of smoking and we're told that microscopy reveals stratified squamous epithelium instead of the normal ciliated columnar epithelium that would be expected in the bronchial mucosa. So this is an example of metaplasia, making A the correct answer, because Barrett esophagus is the only example here of metaplasia. If we go back to this slide on metaplasia, we discussed Barrett's esophagus in some detail, and remember that metaplasia is a stress-induced reversible conversion from one cell type to another. In this case, ciliated columnar epithelium to stratified squamous epithelium. B is wrong because hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an example of hypertrophy. C is wrong because streak ovary is an example of hypoplasia. And finally, D is wrong because cervical cancer is not an example of a growth adaptation, since it's a reversible cancerous process. So again, the correct answer is A, Barrett esophagus. And that concludes this section.